and is likely to mean that both you and the victim will be in danger, the courageous choice is not to intervene, but to call for help instead. According to Aristotle, courage is the midpoint between the extremes of cowardice and recklessness. Cowardice is a deficiency of courage, while recklessness is an excess of courage, and both are bad. Aristotle said that you definitely can have too much of a good thing. So being courageous doesn't mean rushing headlong into danger. A courageous person will assess the situation, they'll know their own abilities, and they'll take action that is right in the particular situation. Part of having courage, he argued, is being able to recognize when, rather than stepping in, you need to find an authority who can handle a situation that's too big for you to tackle alone. Basically, courage is finding the right way to act. And a lot of the time, but not all of the time, that means doing a thing that you know you're capable of, even if doing it scares the pants off of you. Thanks, Thanks Bob Bubble. Aristotle, Aristotle thought all virtue works like this. The right action is always the midpoint between extremes. So there is no all or nothing in this theory, even honesty. In this view, honesty is the perfect midpoint between brutal honesty and failing to say things that need to be said. Like, no one needs to be told that they have a big zit on their face. They all know. know. The, the virtue, virtue of honesty means knowing what needs to be put out there and what you should keep quiet about. about. And it also means knowing how to deliver hard truths gracefully, how to break bad news gently, or to offer criticism in a way that's constructive rather than soul-crushing. The virtue of generosity works the same way. It avoids the obvious vice of stinginess. But ah, Hannah, welcome Hannah. Just, just have a look at the video. To give drugs to an addict, or to buy a round of drinks for everyone in the bar when you need that money for rent. The right amount of generosity means giving when you have it to those who need it. It can mean having the disposition to give just for the heck of it, but it also means realizing when you can't or shouldn't give. So now you can see why Aristotle's definition of virtue was totally vague. Where that golden mean is depends on the situation. But if you have to figure out what virtue is in every situation, how could you possibly ever learn to be virtuous? Aristotle thought there was a lot that you could learn from books, but how to be a good person was not one of them. He said that virtue is a skill, a way of living, and that's something that can only really be learned through experience. Virtue is a kind of knowledge that he called a practical wisdom. You might think of it as kind of like street smarts. And the thing about street smarts is that you gotta learn them on the streets. But the good news is, you don't have to do it alone. Aristotle said your character is developed through habituation. If you do a virtuous thing over and over again, eventually it will become part of your character. But the way you know what the right thing to do is in the first place is by finding someone who already knows and emulating them. These people who already possess virtue are moral exemplars. And according to this theory, we are built with the ability to recognize them and the desire to emulate them. So you learn virtue by watching it and then doing it. In the beginning, it'll be hard and maybe it'll feel fake because you're just copying someone who's better than you at being a good person. But over time, these actions will become an ingrained part of your character. And eventually, it becomes that robust trait that Aristotle was talking about. It'll just manifest every time you need it. That's when you know you have virtue, fully realized. It becomes effortless. Okay, but why? What's your motivation. motivation. What if you what have no desire to beat the guy who always says the right thing or the lady who always finds the courage when it's needed? Virtue theory says that you should become virtuous because if you are, then you can attain the pinnacle of humanity. It allows you to achieve what's known as eudaimonia. This is a cool Greek word that doesn't have a simple English translation. You might say it means a life well lived. It's sometimes translated as human flourishing. And a life of eudaimonia is a life of striving. It's a life of pushing yourself to your limits and finding success. A eudaimonistic life will be full of the happiness that comes from achieving something really difficult rather than just having it handed to you. But choosing to live a eudaimonistic life means that you're never done improving. You're never to a point where you can just coast. You're constantly setting new goals and working to develop new muscles. Choosing to live life in this way also means you'll face disappointments and failures. Eudaimonia doesn't mean a life of cupcakes and rainbows. It means the sweet pleasure of sinking into bed at the end of an absolutely exhausting day. It's the satisfaction of knowing you've accomplished a lot and that you've pushed yourself to be the very best person you could be. This is morality for Aristotle. It's being the best person you can be, honing your strengths while working on your weaknesses. And for Aristotle, the kind of person who lives like this is the kind of person who will do good things. Today we learned about virtue theory. We studied the golden mean and how it exists as a midpoint between the vices of excess and deficiency. We talked about moral exemplars and the life of eudaimonia that comes with virtuousness. Next. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Crash Course Philosophy. I wonder if you watched that already. Maybe you have. That's absolutely fantastic. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, in today's lesson, uh, 
we are going to think about Aristotle a bit more. We're going to think about uh, his virtue ethics. And we're going to focus on something called golden mean. You saw it in the video there. We'll go into it again. And role models, and the importance of role models. Um, building on yesterday's lesson um, that looked at, so yesterday in the purple, we looked at the origins, the historical cultural influences on virtue ethics, its beginnings to model, uh, well, we haven't got to modern developments yet. Um, we looked yesterday at the concept of the well-lived life, uh, eudaimonia as living well. So today then we're looking at in, in red, uh, the golden mean development of virtuous character, virtuous role models, vices, etc. Now, um, on Thursday, I've created a couple, well, three little workbooks for different bits and pieces that cover quite a lot of this and that you can see. Um, so we will be looking at, just to remind you, on Thursday, a little bit more. Do we need to bring on Thursday? Like, do we need to bring a laptop or just like a notepad? No, I'm just assuming it's like a normal lesson. Uh, oh, so whatever you find helpful, Ollie. Yeah. All right. Cheers. So I've I've printed this booklet first of all, which is you can see it's on the website. You can see it now. But I'll give you a printed copy. I have worked my butt off on this. This doesn't exist anywhere. I'm very pleased with this, if I do say so myself. And I'm busy working on a, a sort of little explanation series that nobody else in the country has done. So this is all very bespoke um, on Arthur Basham. And there's a similar couple of booklets on virtue ethics if you look in the, uh, both in the anthology section and in the, uh, so if you look in the anthology, you can preempt or have a look, prepare for tomorrow. Um, so, uh, get down, virtue ethics and Kant, and the booklet that I've created, the lesson work booklet is in there now, um, on just an introduction, and that covers the things we've been doing in these first few lessons here, and so on. So, let's crack on with today's lesson, um, looking at golden mean and the development of character and virtuous role models. Sorry, sir, will we get those two booklets tomorrow? Yeah, on Thursday, okay. I'll give them to you. That's the okay. plan. We're working Cheers. really hard to make sure everything's printed and so okay. that, um, and just to, just to sort of, you know what's going on, Ollie and everyone else, uh, the way I'm trying to plan this, and I did it last year, and it was really helpful, is I'm front loading, I'm doing the heavy lifting uh, before and after the summer. So we're tackling uh, before the summer Aristotle and then the anthology piece of Aristotle. And then when we come back, we're doing Immanuel Kant and the anthology piece to do with Immanuel Kant. Before the summer, we're doing the second Buddhism piece on the Bodhisattva doctrine. And then when we come back, we're going to do the third anthology piece uh, by a guy called Rahula um, and so on. So we've ca already tackled two of the philosophy. And what you'll find is we tackle this early in the year. It just gives us breathing space for later in the year. We're not trying to play catch up with everything. So, and you can get ahead of this I, by just doing the stuff today. So if today, uh, just as we're getting started, you could go to the document that looks like this. I oh, know that's lesson end, lesson start, sorry, lesson start, just to remind ourselves. And so if you go on the um, lesson two, so ethics, uh, you have to scroll all the way down from the top to 5.1, uh, Immanuel Kant and Aristotle, lesson two, and you've got the uh, video we just watched a bit of, and then click on the lesson start and uh, document. And then see what you remember from yesterday. Um, good if you could tell me what is the word eudaimonia. You had a refresher there in the video. And the golden mean. Um, even better, could you name 
a, a virtue that is particular to Aristotle and, a, and the vices, plural, because there are always two vices for every virtue that go with them. So let's see how much you can do and how much we need to do in today's lesson. Is the microphone working better? I've upgraded my microphone. I thought I might go for some soft lighting and, uh, you know, pot plants, a bookcase or something behind me, rather than just being sat in my living room. But, you know, I thought the microphone at least would be a good thing. Okay, let's see what you have done. Hannah's still having a think. Uh, Kimberly says, eudaimonia is human flourishing, striving to the best that you can be. Sounds like a school assembly, doesn't it, uh, Kimberly? Uh, be, the, be the best version of you. Well, yeah. Was Hitler the best version of himself? That's an interesting question. Um, just just be you, as <laughs> Genghis Khan, you know? Um, there's, that's one of the criticisms of the theory. Wisdom, temperance, and modesty, very good. Um, and the golden mean is the position between the two extremes. Um, uh, wisdom, is that a specific prudence? Is that sort of practical wisdom? That would be the proper word to use there, I think. Uh, prudence or pronesis, if you give the Greek, which kind of means wisdom in practice. Uh, it, Kimberly. Isabel says, yes, human flourishing, living well, eudaimonia, middle way between two extremes, temperance and prudence. Um, and the, ah, she's got some vices here, impatience. That's cheating a bit, Isabel, to say uh, patience is a virtue. And the, is, it a, is it a vice of excess or deficiency? Well, obviously it's a, a vice of deficiency. Anger, um, mm, interesting. We'll see. We're going to come back to that. Ollie says, uh, human flourishing, middle way, do the most rational thing. Yes, it's a belief in a rational uh, ethic that you can discover almost empirically by looking at objectively what's the purpose of a thing. And that claim to objectivity, that there is a purpose that things are aimed towards, is the contested bit of virtue ethics and makes it quite, um, well, it's debated quite a lot. Is there a, a, an objective, natural way of doing things, as Aristotle seemed to think? Um, and courage. Courage, an easy one, is a good, good one to go for, Ollie, because it's an easy one to remember. Cowardice would be a, a lack of courage, a deficiency of courage. Ah, what would be too much courage? Would be, we'll have to learn today. We'll look at foolhardiness and what Aristotle means by that. Homer, as well, talks about that. Um, patience and impatience. So we've got uh, virtues. Oh, wow, we're going to learn a little bit more about that. And so on. Okay, right, we'll move on today. Um, if you can have a look at my tab. The heroes here in the image, what virtues, uh, let me ask somebody, pick a picture, uh, let's pick on... I haven't heard from, um, no, no, who's on the line? Uh, Hannah, pick a, pick, a, pick a hero or heroine from that list. And what would you say is their main virtue? Go on, have a, have a go. I know you're a secret Potter fan, aren't you, Hannah? <laughs> Has she typed it in or have you said it? Courage, okay, Harry Potter, courage, yeah, sorry, just looked at it. Um, and by the way, Hannah, yes, I printed off all the booklets that I've referred to. They're being given out on Thursday, working really hard to get ahead of them. Um, let's, okay, 
Um, no, Lord of the Rings. Is it? Oh, what's the name of the character? Anybody remember? Uh, what's his virtue? He was the king, wasn't he? Oh, what's his, um, uh, anybody remember his virtue? He's kingly. He's knightly. He's shh. Maybe it's. Or what about one of the other virtues? Um, Batman. Ollie, what do you think Batman's virtue is? Um, also courage. Courage. He doesn't kill anyone, does he? He's, he always sort of beats them up, but he never kills anyone. So he has, he has mercy, perhaps. Mercy is a virtue. And the main character from, uh, yeah, I forget it, top right. Anybody remember who's that? Go on, tell me. Somebody's bound to be a fan. It's the Hunger Games. Yes, the Hunger Games. What do you reckon? Uh, Kimberly, come on. I bet you're a Hunger Games fan, Kimberly. What do you reckon her virtue is? Um, selflessness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She does. She helps others, doesn't she? She's compassionate and helps others. Fabulous. Okay, I hope there's a little bit of interaction today because I've been working my year nines and they like silence sometimes. It's kind of hard work. All right. So this is this big old fat unit. We are front loading our year with. We're getting some of the big stuff at the beginning of the year, as you know, and uh, Aristotle, and we'll move on. So today we need to learn about uh, virtue, vice, and the golden mean. That's absolutely essential. And how Aristotle develops the idea of virtuous character and the, the use of role models. Um, and we're going to think of some applications partway through the lesson, particularly to do with war and what a soldier. It's one of the most common applications. We've already talked about courage. What are the vices of excess and deficiency in that? I'm trying to be a little bit more interactive today, but we're going to start with a little bit of explanation. On the video, you saw this, and I'll just explain it again. It's called the doctrine of the golden mean. One way you can become virtuous is by using your, your own wisdom, your own knowledge, your own rationality. Remember the, the theory of the soul that Aristotle is working with? And uh, I wanted to post a little video about Aristotle's theory of the soul. That would be a good one to revise. But the highest part, the highest faculty of the soul is reason. Uh, so for Aristotle, the good life meant following the doctrine. Doctrines are rational statements of belief of the mean. So the rational statement about the belief in the mean. What is the mean? What is the belief? The middle path between two extremes. And being virtuous means neither being deficient. So you mentioned some deficient uh, vices and the vice of impatience or dishonesty. Nor excessive well uh being overly fastidious would be the i know the patience you know, can you be too patient well that's an interesting you know kind of question um the idea is being properly balanced courage is the either some of these vices and virtues that are easy to uh delineate to show and courage is the main one rashness is an excess of courage and cowardice is a, a deficiency of courage. And you learn to pick up the right balance of through, if not through your reason, by thinking about it, your rationality, then through practice or better habit, choosing to do it over and over or being made to do it over and over till you habituate the practice and the practice becomes uh, ingrained, it becomes habitual. You just do it because it's there in you. That's the theory, and it is challenged very much today that we can ever do that truly or fully in anyone. So this, the one part of this is practice, but the golden mean bit is the rational bit of this. This is discovered by the intellect, by education. And it leads to genuine pr pronesis or, pra or prudence or practical wisdom. And, and from that moral virtues, we last lesson, we looked at 
the intellectual virtues and the moral virtues. And the moral virtues are needed for practical life, to live in society, to live with other people. Um, Aristotle distinguishes those between moral and intellectual, setting out what he saw as the 12 key moral virtues with their corresponding deficiencies and excesses. And we're going to look at those later. So as an example, before we look at these, modesty. Uh, Mr. Kernan is very modest. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, he's not shamelessly uh, blowing his trumpet about how amazing he is, nor is he bashful about saying, well, I'm good at this and I'm not good at that. That's modesty. It's in the middle. It's okay. Um, wittiness. I know you all believe my jokes are just amazing. I heard one about um, COVID-19, but I better not say it online um, the other day. Um, COVID-19 and Chuck Morris. Uh, there you go. Um, if, if anyone who's in Chuck, yeah, you'd see it all. There you go. Maybe I'm not so witty. So maybe I have a deficiency of wittish and I'm just a bit boorish. Oh, Mr. Kernan is so boring. Um, or maybe I'm so witty, I'm a bit of a buffoon. I'm always the clown. And I bet you can think of people in, uh, I wouldn't dare to say our class, but maybe in your previous experience who are boorish or buffoons. And then people who are, well, they're a bit witty and they're, they're good company and so on. So in summary, a virtue is a moral excellence. Um, and there are different kind of things thinking about, is this more like a skill that's, that is ingrained in us or is it more like a goal that we are aiming towards? Arete is the term that is used in both Homer and Plato and, and, especially, and Socrates and especially Aristotle, a character trait, an arete, a quality that we might have or we might aspire to have, that is others and we would value. So these arete, these uh, personal virtues are characteristics valued because they promote the individual and collective eudaimonia, well-being, and thus they're good by definition, as it were. Uh, and we thought about some examples. Okay, shout me an example around each of you, and I want you to give me an example of a arete, a trait, a, a strength, a virtue. Here it comes, just shout one out. Ollie? Which one, sorry? Give, give me an example of a virtue. The next person has to give me a different one. <laughs> um, mercy. Mercy, I love it. Hannah, give me a different one than mercy. Mercy uh, and? Modesty. Mercy and modesty. Isabel, give me a different one. Bravery. Mercy and modesty and bravery. I was going to play a little game with this. Kimberly. Being generous. Being generous. Mercy and modesty and bravery and generous. Ollie? I didn't think this was coming. Can you give me a different one? Was wit one or was that one you were just saying? <laughs> Mercy and modesty and bravery and generosity and wit. Back to where we are up to. Kimberly. See who drops out first. Oh, she's going to drop out three. Two. I'll drop out. Okay. Hannah? Um, liberality. Yeah, I'll take that. Back to Ollie then. It's like tennis. Can you think of a different one? Is justice one or something? Am I supposed yeah, to it? Hannah, come on, don't let the side down. Come on, girls, come on, the girls. Um, friendliness. Friendliness, oh, I'll give it to you. Go on, Ollie. You're just making words up now, I think. No, I don't, I don't have any more. Oh, Hannah's the winner! Yay! I would help you celebrate with some sort of screen emoji, Hannah, if I could. <laughs> technical know-how i don't i'm afraid i don't okay uh what is not a virtue so the opposite of virtues we said are vices um no 
There's not just one vice for every virtue. There are two kinds of vices. So what are vices there? And if I say someone is vicious, I'm, I'm using a technical term to say they're full of um, character weaknesses. Um, vices are character or personality traits that don't promote their, the individual well-being or the well-being of wider society. And by definition, therefore, they are negative. They shouldn't uh, be avoided. Um, you should aim to get rid of them in your life, leaving more space for virtuous action. Okay, let's play the game again. Come on, this is interaction. I'm doing my best. Right, uh, let's start with Hannah because she was the winner last time. Give me a vice, something that's a weakness in people. Uh, I, um, I can't think of any. Did I hear yeah. dishonesty? Yeah, I like jealousy. Jealousy, okay. Uh, Isabel. Short tempered. Yes, Ollie. Um, um, the opposite, which was the boorishness, wasn't it? Boorishness, yes, Kimberly. Lazy. Lazy, back to Hannah. Um, greediness. Greediness, yes, Isabel. Don't drop out on me, Lazy. I'll drop out. Oh, Izzy, come on. Ollie. Corruption. Corruption, okay. Yeah, that's, is that a, is that, no, this is the thing, Ollie, you have to, uh, what is the corruption is made of a collection of lower things that's you analyze what it is what is corruption well it is a collection of other things so what are those other things i'm going to say that knocks you out ollie kimberly um cow being cowardly cowardly so kimberly and hannah want uh, a face off right hannah um laziness oh no kimberly said that already <laughs> <laughs> kimberly's the winner very good Okay, let's go on. So how do you work out what a virtue is? Now, here's a nice little mnemonic, and this comes from some people who want schools to teach character, called the National Framework for Character Education. And you can look it up on the Birmingham University website. And their big motto is this, virtue can be taught, caught, and it should be sought. So... The rational person seeks to become virtuous. They, they seek it out. It's sought. And some kinds of people can catch it by inspiration, by role models. And, and many of us at least can be taught or trained, I guess, in virtue. So how does it work? How do we get to become virtuous? And the wise people... The people who have this prenesis, this practical wisdom, who the prudent people can be taught they can, or they can teach themselves using reason. They seek it. Um, and they know that virtue ethics is seen as a middle way between excess and deficiency of virtue. It's the ethics of the average. Um, and you use the average to decide which is the correct moral virtue by deciding the middle point between these extremes. So there are 12 moral virtues, and then there are four intellectual virtues, according to Aristotle. Um, courage, liberality, temperance, modesty, and so on. In other words, emulation, so we see our heroes and heroines, Education, listen to your teachers. They know they are well practiced in prenesis. They are prudent people who can tell you what the right virtues are. And then for most people, experience. We have to experience and develop it in our own practice and train ourselves or habituate ourselves. So this keyword prenesis or prudence. All those three uh, things, sorry, what was the first one? Emulation. So that's using the inspiration of heroes. I started the lesson thinking about Batman and um, right, thank you. other characters. Mr. Kern, I could have put a photograph of myself up there, but that wouldn't be modest, would it? 
that would be uh, that would be um, buffoonish, I suppose, or uh, something else. Um, education and experience. So, prenesis is the ability to govern and discipline oneself. And in Aristotle's thinking, and this is a weakness of the thinking, it's quite individualistic. It wants to say, you yourself, you have a responsibility to help yourself. And there's a little bit of right versus left thinking going on here. On Friday, I have my doctoral viva, or my two vivas, that's the first of them. And virtue ethics is criticized because it doesn't really take account of the social context you're in. It's quite individualistic. It says, if you can't help yourself, then no one else can help you. You've got to use your own practical wisdom to discipline and govern yourself through sheer grit and determination. Think of lectures by American generals at the end of university uh, graduation ceremonies. You know, make your bed, take charge of your life. Only you can, through self-discipline, and this fails to account, in a way, we'll come back to much later on, for the social context of virtue. And we're affected by society and, and social and emotional contexts. So moral virtues, intellectual virtues, other kinds of virtues lie between two extremes. And there's a relativistic streak of virtue ethics because every time we face an ethical choice, a moral choice, no, we realize no two situations are the same. In every situation, you have to work out a new middle way between the, the, the extremes that are presented to you. And the person who's, it's believed, developed, the person who's virtuous will, will almost automatically know what the right thing is to do and just do it, even without thinking in the situation. And they use their reason and they make the right choice. So here's a list of, uh, of mostly, well, of moral virtues, um, moral virtues of Aristotle's golden mean. Um, what I want us to do is go through and think if we can think of the vice that goes with these. So let's start with the first. Um, if the, the vice of excess is rashness and the vice of deficiency is cowardness, uh, being cowardice. We know this one. We've said it a few times already. Hannah, what's the what's the what's the virtue? Oh, yes. Of cowardice. Of cowardice. What's the what's the opposite of cowardice, or what's the middle Courage. one? Courage. Courage. Well done. Courage. Um, let's go to some of this is more difficult. Um, we'll just have a guess. Uh, Izzy. Uh, licentiousness, indulgence, liberalism on one side, I, you're a waster. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say to somebody. Insensibility, no emotion, unable to enjoy pleasure. What's, have a guess, Izzy, what's the middle way? What sort of word would you use? What's I'm sorry, could you repeat that? And you see the second one. So between recklessness, liberality, uh, being oh, indifferent. Um temperance wow that's amazing is he well done temperance temperance is self-restraint but it's not completely the temperance movements in, in the 18th century that avoided were all alcohol um uh wasn't really temperance it was you know it was getting rid of all stuff that's not what temperance means it means a sort of a, a moderate use a moderate use of things I know when I've had enough, my father-in-law used to say. <laughs> he valued his virtue. Okay, uh, miserliness is an excess of this. Uh, reckless spending is a weak, as a, a, a deficiency in this. Ollie, what do you think? Have a guess. Can't have any like specific words for it. I know. Unfortunately, I think. Okay. Uh, all right, look at this one. Generosity. So if you're uh, not... If, uh, people who are deficient in generosity are miserly. Um, 
people who are too just possibly be, he thinks to be too generous and give away stuff you know prodigiously think of the story of the prodigal son it's an interesting use of the word isn't it the reckless father who gives uh, the reckless son um who, who uses it. okay uh kimberly uh pedantry and vulgarity any idea what the middle way there might be um this is just a guess but is it magnificent i am blown away fantastic what a difficult word magnificent um my you know it means you're sort of sober in the way you speak and think you're a kind of you have a sort of a, a gravitas to you as it were okay uh back to hannah uh, vanity and spinelessness what back might be the middle way I sort of know what it is, but I can't think of the one word. What's the nearest thing you can think of? What's the opposite of being spineless? Like right, yes. Right, yeah. Okay, that's not bad. Um, so being a good sort is, is magnanimity is, is the word that Aristotle used, and it means, um, you know, somebody who has a bit of courage but isn't so up themselves. You know, they're a good sort of chap. The English people would say. So between um, lack of ambition, being unduly humble, and being overly ambitious, what's the middle way? Uh, where are we up to, Hannah, Olivia? Izzy. And, Izzy, sorry. Um, aspiration? Yes, proper ambition. Aspiration is a nice word, though, actually. And um, back to Ollie. Sorry, Lack of spirit is, is a deficiency. Uh, too much is being short-tempered. What's the middle way? Calm. Very good. Patient. Very uh, close. Uh, close An analog between the two. Calm, being patient. Uh, synonyms for each other, aren't they? Um, Kimberly, you could be boastful, that would be an excess of vice, or you could be understated. What would be the middle way between the two? Is it being truthful? Yes, very good. Um, we heard this one before, Hannah, being a buffoon is too much, being boorish is too little. Um, wittiness. Yes, being witty. The difficult one, Izzy. Um, cantankerous, Mr. Kernan is all cantankerous. He doesn't get his essay. Uh, and then this weird word, obsequietousness, uh, means a doormat. What might be the middle way there? Describe it if you want. Um, modesty. Not bad. Or not bad. sincerity. Uh, yeah, that's even better. Um, so uh, friendliness is is what you'd say so if you're somebody's cantankerous they don't want to be your friend i don't want to be your friend Ooh. um i be your friend the person who's desperate to have friends be my friend be my friend and who accepts relationships friendships with dodgy people i guess is the way to think about it um ollie between shyness and shamelessness Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, uh, modesty. So you're you're confident in the person you are, your strengths, your weaknesses, and that's modesty, as it were. Shit. And then lastly, Kimberly, between envy and being spiteful. Um, is it being indignant? Yeah, being righteously indignant. So these are the actual terms that. Uh, Aristotle uses. Very good, everybody. Very good. Um, so courage in practice. Let's apply it now. Let's think about our average soldier or warriors, as it were. Um, and let's take the easy moral virtue of courage. Uh, so 
So here's the story. Uh, on the battlefield, somebody uh, is injured. Maybe this is the, you're thinking of the, like the, the trenches and somebody's out there in the field and they got injured. They go out. Um, some, a fallen soldier, as it were. Uh, the person who would just leave the fallen soldier, is that a, 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 a virtue or a vice, um, Hama? A vice. A vice. And is it a vice of deficiency or a vice of excess? Um, it, uh, deficiency. Yeah, so it's the deficiency of courage, isn't it? That's nice. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, the person who would go chasing after the fallen colleague without any regard to his own safety. Uh, is, he, is, is that a vice or a virtue? Virtue. Ooh, it's a vice. Um, but think, is it the vice of excess or deficiency? Excess. Yeah, you're a rush. You're going out into the battlefield, not thinking about the danger, or like, and so. Um, and let's pick on Kimberly. Uh, the person who organizes a plan and using other members of his team to rescue the full, sol, fallen soldier. Oh, is that a, a virtue or a vice? It's a virtue. That's a virtue. So therefore, it doesn't have a deficiency or it doesn't have an excess. Well done, everybody. So this is the list of 12, as it were, moral virtues in which Aristotle thinks we need for pronesis. We need to use in practical life with other people. Um, and to figure out the moral virtues, which are the contested ones, um, we can do it using our, our knowledge uh, or through our experience. Uh, we can aim for the middle way. But... Just as a little uh, critical point, is we can ask the question, argu arguably, the doctrine of the mean itself is an extreme to be avoided. Therefore, we should always aim for the mean of the mean. <laughs> so that's, that sort of undermines the whole doctrine. So we aim, sometimes aim for the mean of the mean. And that could be used to justify all kinds of vice, couldn't it? But it could also be used to justify all kinds of virtue. What about love? Is it, um, uh, is it ever possible to have too much love? Uh, to have an excess of being love? I can think. I can imagine there being a deficiency of love. But is love something you can have an excess of? Worth thinking of that. Um, the mean of the mean and how that goes. Um, let's think of what are, there, there might be certain signature virtues or perhaps signature vices for particular people in particular jobs. Um, let's have a think about this. Again, there's a lot of interaction today. Um, so let's pick on somebody in a second. Um, sorry, the R has come down there. A banker. <laughs> Popular people. Um, uh, Kimberly, what? Do you, can you think of the, you could think of, it's sometimes easier to think of the vice than the virtue. If you start with the vice and then think of the virtue, what might be the vices of a banker? Um, not being truthful with people. So like not being honest and being quite secret about everything and not telling people like, I guess, the truth about their finances and stuff. And so obviously what is the, the virtue of a banker? Um, honesty. Yeah, you see how it works. It's easier to think, I often think it's easier to think of the the vices then think of the virtue. All right, let's look at another one. Oh, my R's have gone down. Anyway, the formatting keeps. Uh, let's see what I picked on. Uh, Izzy, uh, tell me what do you think? We've already talked about soldiers, so you should have a, a know about this. What would be the vices of a soldier? Cowardice. Yeah, and probably rashness as well. And then obviously what's the, the virtue of a soldier, the signature virtue? Bravery. Bravery would be the, so you had other virtues, but he might have one that you might just define as the signature virtue or the the gateway virtue as a an idea in virtue ethics. Ah, ah, close to my heart. The teacher, uh, Ollie, tell me what is what are my vices? There are vices that teachers have. 
<laughs> what should I avoid, Ollie? Um, uh, apathy and irritability. Oh, irrit irritability. irritability. Yeah, I love it. And therefore, what are the virtues? Composure. Composure and um, I suppose... Apathy. Yeah. What's the opposite? Apathy. It's kind of um, not courage. It's patience or tenacity, resilience. It's a sort of performance virtue, I think you would call it. Uh, Kimberly, I think we're back to uh, an athlete. What are the what's the signature virtue of an athlete? Uh, I think back to wait. Was it me or Kimberly? Oh, that'll do. Hannah, you're online. Hannah, tell us about an athlete. Um, it'd be ambition. Would be the yeah. one. And then the vice of uh, the opposite. The vices of ambition. Um, sloth. Sloth and and, and greed. <laughs> There was, it's, it's the stuff of comedy, you know, isn't it? I saw some uh, comedy comedians, I was looking at the BBC, comedians at home, and this woman was uh, male and female comedians, and she was basically staying in bed all day and eating stuff. There you go. And lastly, Kimberly then, uh, journalists. What might be the signature, the key vice of, of, of journalists? Um, secrecy. Secrecy, and therefore honesty, knowing their sources and so on. Fabulous. So hopefully we have a good idea of the, the what a vice is as, a, as an excess or a deficiency. And if you don't know courage now, you really, really should. Okay, so uh, foolhardiness, rashness, um, that's too much courage. Too little courage would be cowardice. We can think of the vices of other uh, virtues as well. So sought, caught, taught, and um, caught in this sense, ours, it goes back to our and neo Aristotelian theories that we had we develop virtue by thinking about role models as a method of developing virtue. We can use our reason, but we can also be inspired. Uh, we are by nature people who copy biological. It's it's hardwired into us, like monkeys who copy other monkeys. We like to copy people. We copy our parents, then we copy our peers. It's empirical. It's claimed that we are copying creatures. So inspiration is a good approach, it is thought, to virtue acquisition or gaining virtue. And Aristotle said good, the good person is the one, or the, the person who exhibits eudaimonia, uh, is the one who learns from and copies virtuous role models it's equally possible to copy vicious role models. You know, show me your friends and I'll show you what you're, you're going to become, what you're, you're, you'll be like in 10 years time. You know, um, he should, uh, we should train and exercise our virtues until they become an automatic way of living. And um, we do that through eudaimonia, uh, through habituation, through the conscious effort of our will. And we do it by consciously, explicitly copying a good role model. And every citizen, Aristotle says, it's their moral duty to both copy good role models and to be a good role model. So as a year 12 tutor, uh, one of the things I often do is a little tactic. I often say that my year 13 or year 12, and you boys, you girls, you're the role models for the younger years in the room. And I make an Aristotelian argument you know and they're looking to you to your you know kimberly the rest of the class is looking to you for your tenacity and resilience and so on izzy is you know looks up to kimberly to as a, as a role model of, of 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 compassion and love and of excellence and so on i, I joke i joke um it's very hard to joke online. Maybe my, that's not wittiness. That's buffoonery, is it? Is that buffoonery? Could be buffoonery. Um, and we've looked at role models in contemporary society. They can be good or they can be bad. It's quite interesting to see how politicians who want to be in the public but don't want to be role models. Um, can you? And this is a really interesting question. Do your politicians need to be moral individuals? Do your actors, do your musicians... Do they have a, a responsibility to be good role models because they're in the public eye? And newspapers love to set people up and then knock them down. Isn't this person amazing? 
oh, look, they're such a bad role model. And this is just basic biology, basic empirical observation, Aristotle would say. Um, prominent people in society are role models and they should take such a position seriously. And wanting to have public uh, visibility without public responsibility is a problem in our society. It certainly is. We can all think of examples of public figures. Uh, uh, if I named our prime minister, you know, who sets bad examples by doing certain things or his advisors or etc. etc. Here's some uh, possible role models uh, that uh, might be ex exhibit virtue or vice. Um, far left. Who's that, Ollie? And what virtue or vice do you think they they is their signature, as it were? It's uh, Nelson Mandela. Yes. Um, what would you say is his either vice or his virtue? Um, righteousness, but also courage. Yes. Yes. Um, to be fair, he had vices as well. Uh, he, him and his wife had a very strained relationship. So, and all people have virtue and vice. Even Mr. Kernan, David, oh, sorry, I was going to say, Kimberly, who's, who's next? Um, that's David Beckham. I say he's got ambition. Ambition. He is pretty virtuous, isn't it? He's got a squeaky voice, but, you know, he's pretty squeaky clean. Can you think of any vices of David Beckham? Dig the dirt. Go on, dig the dirt. Maybe uh, self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. I love the thing, Kimberly. He bought himself some Lego. This is true. And it was age, age six. <laughs> and, and his wife was keeping going because he was doing some Lego age six. Brilliant. All right. Izzy, I know you're up on uh, your Hello magazine and your internet, whatever. Who's this in the middle? Is that one of the Kardashians? It is indeed one of the Kardashians. Hmm. Virtue or vice, what are you going to go for? Um, I, I don't know. Can we move on? <laughs> okay. Or self-indulgent. Self-indulgent, okay. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt their feelings, Izzy, I hope. Maybe I've hurt somebody else's feelings. But this is your hero, your inspiration. Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, Hannah, is. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Gandhi is your role model. Uh, or is he not? Uh, what are the virtues or vices of the next figure? Um, his virtues would be like righteousness. Yeah, he's a good guy. He had a lot of vices as well. Um, he was not very nice to his wife. Uh, he practiced all kinds of weird stuff. He was practiced uh, no sex in marriage. Ooh, that doesn't sound very empathetic towards his wife. And there's other things. And he has a great many virtues. And lastly, who's this? Uh, back to Ollie. Last, the last one, did you say? Yeah. It is um, Martin Luther King. Yeah. Do you, know he many up, yeah. Do you know any vices he had? Um, no. Well, apparently he had an adulterous relationship, so... Again, I wonder what the vice is beneath that, the moral vice of um, is greed. You know, he wanted more sex than he was due, as it were, or self-indulgence. But he had many virtues, of course. He had courage par excellence, composure, temperance, um, wisdom, uh, prudence, you know, under fire all the time. But people have both virtue and vice, and they're always working at them. So we've looked at role models and how they inspire us to be uh, more virtuous, but how they could, bad role models could inspire us to be more vicious. And we think of all kinds of evil people in the world who could do that. Um, and we want to think about two more things today, this practice of everyday virtue ethics and the practice of virtue ethics for the ordinary person using prudence or pronesis or practical wisdom. And 
Aristotle argues there must be a continual attempt. It's your responsibility to develop your virtue. No one else. And it's quite, this is quite a, an interesting point in virtue ethics. And how? Well, to have a continuing awareness of your circumstances in which you are acting in. Now, there's good and bad bits to this. So this, this prudence, this pronesis. Um, a person, now here's a key word, must desire. We are desiring creatures. Remember his theory of the soul, to do good. And then we must know when and how to do good. And how do you know when and how to do good? Well, you practice making choices. You make mistakes. And you get better at it. And this is a process called habituation, habit forming, until uh, habits become, you know, practices. We, we, you know, we start with beliefs. We then we develop uh, practices, and then we develop uh, habits, and that develops character. And the Aristotle says in Nicomachean Ethics, he says the virtues cannot exist without prudence. A proof of this is that everyone, even in the present day, is defining virtue after saying what disposition is, i.e. moral virtue, and specifying the things in which it would be concerned, adds that it is by a disposition determined by the right principle, and the right principle is the principle determined by prudence. Now that's interesting. It sounds a bit circular. How do you know what the right thing is to do? Well, you do the right thing, then you'll know what the right thing was to do. Well, hold on, that's... But what should I do? Well, do some do something, as you know. So there's a little little voice in your head that should be saying, "Hang on, this sounds very relativistic, very in um, circular in thinking." Um, you already have to know what the right thing is in a way to then practice doing the right thing. So if Aristotle, the genuinely virtuous person, is virtuous all the time, even when they're asleep because they've cultivated the habit of virtue. I know that all four of you, even when you sleep, do nothing at all ever on virtuous. I'm not even going to go there. Um, if, uh, you know, uh, not, that, that's inappropriate. Not even think that. That's, a, that's buffoonery, Mr. Kearney. Don't do it. These habits enable us to say a person is good and to anticipate what they will do given uh, a dis their display of goodness. And there's certain wisdom. If you see someone who has a habit of doing the good thing, then you can be, you know, modestly assured that in the future they will do the good thing, the right thing. But if you see someone whose habit is to do the bad thing, well, wisdom is to think, well, on balance, they might do the bad thing in the future. And that's a, a proverbial piece of wisdom. It doesn't hold true all the time, but we should take it under advice. Um, prudence is key, practical wisdom, pronesis. It is a word that has a general sense of knowing the proper behavior in all situations. I always say to my young teachers, give it 10 years and you'll be a great teacher. Well, I've given it nearly 30 years and I'm still not a great teacher. I'm all not bad sometimes. It takes practice and constant uh, repractice to be good at something. Pronesis is an intellectual, not a moral virtue, because we learn pronesis through instruction, not through practice. You can't gain pronesis. You have to learn it. You have to get it from somewhere else. It's connected with the moral virtues because without pronesis, it would be impossible to practice the moral virtues properly. You have to know something about the virtues, the moral virtues especially, to practice them. A person who has the right moral virtues knows what ends to pursue, but without premises, that person will not know how to set about pursuing the right ends. Contrary to modern assumptions, Aristotle is telling us that having one's heart in the right place is not good enough. So the right intention. Um, remember, natural moral law talks about intention. Um is important. And Aristotle doesn't think intention is, is that important. It's about practice. Being a good person requires to pra the practical intelligence uh, inte as well as good disposition. On the other hand, a person who is pronesis does not have it 
uh, that, who doesn't, but does not have the right moral virtues, will be very effective in devising means uh, to personal ends. But those ends might not be noble. Uh, think about Hitler, or we can think of several people who had a great many actual, they wouldn't be moral virtues, but they would be like resilience and, and leadership and in intellectual virtues as well. The people who invented the gas chambers had many intellectual virtues, but their moral virtues, I think we would all say are deficient. Think about the typical villains in James Bond. They typically show prenesis. They show a capacity to devise evil schemes in which to kill Mr. Bond. Ah, Mr. Bond, I have strapped you up and this laser is about to cut you in half. <laughs> and they stroke their cat. Well, it takes Pronesis to invent a laser to attach it to a shark and then to attack Mr. Bond with the shark and laser. I'm sure that's an episode, but if it's not, it should be sharks with lasers. So we develop through habituation. Remember that word I underlined it there in the bottom left? The Pronesis involves engaging, the intentional engagement in a process of a habituation. So it's both thinking and it's then praxis or pr pr uh, practice. It's thinking put into practice that creates habits that habituates you. Some people have virtue, but it's a minority of people, naturally. You think of some people, it seems to just come naturally. And actually when you investigate the people who seem to be naturally virtuous, you discover that through some process, maybe at a very early age they've they have discovered habit i've learned that through my doctoral research actually very interesting therefore the doctrine of the golden mean means helping people to work out what is the correct action they should take for some people who don't know you use the doctrine of the golden mean to educate them education is the key to virtue um, as is inspiration and role models. Practicing the golden mean will help you work out what the correct thing is to do in life. And this is the way Aristotle puts it. Edu excellence, what he means by that is the person who's well habituated in virtue, the virtuous person who has many strengths or excellencies, is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have the virtue or excellence but we rather have those because we have acted right in past tense. And what we have repeatedly do, excellence then is not an act, but a habit, or better, the result of a habit. Aristotle sort of defines four groups of people. The virtuous people, those who exercise prudence. If they don't know what the right thing is to do, they intentionally practice until they have developed the habits and virtues that are good. Then he says there are continent people, people who do the virtuous thing most of the time, but often have to overcome um, moral dilemmas. You don't know, maybe through inspiration, maybe through education, and so on. Then there are the incontinent people, the people when they face when they're faced with moral conflict, they usually choose vice, and that's the stuff of internet memes you know, with a five pound note stuck to the floor and that sort of thing. Um, people who love to do the, you know, we just, and we love to celebrate people who do, you know, but we shouldn't because people have different journeys. And then there are vicious people, people who never attempt to be virtuous, who delight in being vicious. And I'm afraid there are people like that out in the world. You wouldn't believe it, but there just are people who are consumed with being vicious. They're in the minority, and we might call them pathological even. We might even call lock them up in insane asylums. But there's an interesting um, gradient, I would say, a spectrum from being just a vicious person to being insane, frankly. Habit is important. Aristotle believed that these four groups of people in society needed ver all needed to exercise habit. Some people do it intentionally. They are wanting, they, they are virtuous people. Some need help to develop habit. Some have, are doing the wrong habits. And some have so viciously practiced evil that they have become just evil people, I guess you would say. 
Virtuous people then do not need help, but these other kinds of people do need help. And that's how the process, that's for the people that the process of education in virtue, habituation, inspiration works. Coming into land today, um, the so what of today's lesson, we've learned that the education of the of people using the, the, the doctrine of the golden age. So I've tried to educate you, I've tried to do a practical lesson, making you think what's the, the mean between the two extremes. That was a process of education. Um, I wonder, does that make you a, a virtuous person? You know, I'm automatically not going to eat the chocolate cake or the chocolate ice cream I have in the freezer. No, 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 I'm not doing it. Um, Aristotle assumes the existence of freedom. We all have, this is one of the weaknesses. He, all, he thinks we all have are basically equally free to do what we choose to do. And we're not influenced by social or situational features. This is the great weakness of Aristotelian thinking. Um, he believes that anyone who puts enough effort can overcome their situation and achieve goodness. Well, I wonder is that true for everybody or are some people situation so horrible that that's just not possible. And in sociology, we would call this uh, a deficit ideology, a deficit form of thinking that we blame the children and try and fix children, not fix the situation, fix the society in which the children live. If we had to do an, an exam question, and we're going to think about this in a second, explore Aristotle's theory of virtue ethics. We've now introduced it in, in full. And we're going to look at it tomorrow, it's Wednesday today, in class, um, using uh, an extract, an anthology extract that's on the website. What I'd like you to do, you've all been very good, is go to the Google Classroom again, and then click on the lesson end task, um, which looks like this. And then if you were answering this eight mark question, can you give me one point from yesterday's lesson and today's lesson that you have now know that you would add? So something that maybe especially new you've learned today, something you want to re review from yesterday, and we'll see if together we can formulate an eight mark question. Okay, off you go. Let's see how virtuous you are. I'll do a bit of buffoonery here while you're doing it. Oh, am I witty? Uh, I'm not sure. Ooh, Kimberly, are you okay? Just, um, are you still here, Kimberly? Oh, Kimberly's left the meeting. Oh, well. Okay, we'll see how we've done and uh, what else we could add. So between yesterday's lesson, it looked at the origins. Uh, so the question was explore the main features of, let me just remind myself of the question. Yeah, explore the main features of virtue ethics. Um, yeah, there it is at the top. Uh, 
So Ollie says there are three different types of people based on what they uh, based on what they love. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's linked. So you could develop the language there, Ollie. Um, but Aristotle's theory of the soul. Uh, we are fundamentally desiring creatures. We are. We look at what's desirable. Um, we look for desiratire is a word that's used. The things that are desirable, and the lower part of the animal side of our nature. So we are. So, uh, he calls us social animals. Aristotle called people social animals, um, and they automatically move towards what they love. You become what you love. That's a. And it's also an Augustinian idea, actually, Ollie. Augustinian idea. Um, you are what you love. Um, and what we find pleasure in. Uh, and the, the lowest form of people who nevertheless gain some limited virtue are people who are just responding to our basic desires. Yes, then you've got the politicians who, who desire something a little bit higher. Um, again, that's a, a sub-faculty of the soul aimed at the noble. Aristotle has this idea of the chariot and the two horses. Um, the, the, the bit of the soul, the faculty of the soul that's about emotion and desire, the faculty of the soul that's aimed at what's noble, what, that desires recognition and nobility, and then the rational bit of the soul. Very good. So just developing the vocabulary there, Oli, um, maybe bring in a quotation, that'd be really good. Hannah says, virtues are moral excellencies. Yes, um, or you could use the word arete uh, or traits. Again, scaling up your vocabulary there, Hannah would be good. They are valued characteristics because they lead to individual and collective eudaimonia. Super language and good use of the word eudaimonia. Perfect insight. Izzy, yes, are superior and in, uh, uh, subordinate aims. Uh, for every, we are teleological creatures. Aristotle's theory of uh, causation is at work here. I put a little video, Isabel, I, I find a, a nice little video to remind us Aristotle's four theories of cause in the Google Classroom lesson. And developing from his theory of causation, the fun, um, we, like anything else in the universe, is orientated towards a cause. We are things that move from our potential from an actual state to a potential state and we could be we are potentially more vicious or more virtuous as it were um we're actually in a state of virtue or vice um, and if we aim to being uh, more virtuous in one particular virtue well we get better but there must be a, a most important telios or goal and that is to be a, a totally virtuous individual, to be uh, someone who lives well, life well, who exhibits eudaimonia for themselves and for, and who helps build the, the eudaimonious society. A person who has both virtue and vice within them, we all do, and it's always shifting, it's always moving. They're, but Aristotle at least seemed to think it was possible to actualize virtue. Be, at least known as someone who's virtuous, at least in some ways. And this is contended by other scholars, particularly sociologists like Karl Marx and others, uh, middle way between the golden mean and so on. Fantastic. Good work today. Um, so in summary, uh, if you just go back to the last slide, what have we learned about Aristotle's ethics? Uh, last lesson. We learned about human excellence is the, the ultimate goal, uh, i.e. Uh, eudaimonia, excellence for the individual, excellence for society. That the highest good is related to the highest faculty of the soul, which is intellectual virtue. However, the moral virtues are pragmatically necessary for living practically in the world. That when we contemplate what to do, we are and educate ourselves in virtue, um, using the highest faculty of the soul, as it were, um, we can actually think about becoming a morally virtuous person, what a morally virtuous person would do. Or we might choose to, to habituate certain practices to develop character. Um, we, in The way we would think about this would follow the doctrine of the golden mean. 
live a balanced life, avoid actions that are an expression of a vice of excess or a deficiency. And we would imitate the behavior of virtuous role models. And we would try and become, we would aim to become a virtuous role model. And the key virtue perhaps for Aristotle is prudence or practical wisdom. It is the practice of virtue. Well done today. That is us for today. Um, I'm hoping to see all of you tomorrow, uh, just after nine o'clock. I said 9.20.